Hi and welcome. So I wasn't originally on, planning on making a part two of this bushing project, uh, but the manufacturing process may be interesting. There were some minor changes made to the part when I gave the sample to the customer, and uh, those changes are a slightly smaller brooch, which will make the two holes for the, the pilot hole and the uh, clearance holes change. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. Uh, but I thought there'd be some interesting bits I could uh, bring up in how I plan on manufacturing this. I know I alluded to it last time, but I thought a little more about the process this time. So I'll, uh, I'll show you how I plan on making this uh, somewhat faster step by step. Uh, there's a couple interesting introductions to uh, uh, Baco, which is a subsidiary of Snap-on of all people. Uh, I believe it's a Swedish company. I see it's snap on industrial brands. Uh, they make bandsaw blades, and uh, that in and of itself is not remarkable, but they came out with this new uh, patented design called Easy Cut. And the Easy Cut bandsaw blades, which I'm going to be using here, normally you need at least two or three teeth to engage the material uh, unless you want to risk breaking a tooth off. Uh, so if you're, if you're normally cutting really thick material and use a, a wide tooth pattern, like say to four to six teeth per inch, and then you want to cut some thin stock, like eighth inch aluminum stock, uh, it's a bit of a risky deal because uh, you're not going to engage enough teeth at one time. According to uh, the gentleman at Snap-on who represents Baco, he said the easy cut blades have solved that problem with a new design and uh, we're going to give that a shot because I've already cut thick material and they seem to work pretty well. Uh, these are, uh, I forget how many uh, teeth per inch this is. It's a, I guess it's just their standard style. They have like one style for these. So it's a three quarter inch wide blade, 10, in, 10 feet, 10 inches, 10 feet long, I'm sorry, 120 inches and 0.035 thick. And, uh, they only have one toothpick, I guess. I, I think that's right. And so, uh, we're going to give us a shot on some thinner material here. I also need to take this guy over the surface grinder, and since it's a smaller square hole, I need to make this guy smaller. And I know that you can see here, this was quickly done. It's not perfectly uh, perpendicular here, but that's not really important. The only thing that's important is that this face is parallel to this face so that I can use it to line up the parts in the mill for the slotting operation. So uh, I'm going to take it over the surface grinder and we're going to grind some material off this. Then we're going to go over to the bandsaw and uh, my bandsaw stop that came with the bandsaw is a bit of a disappointment. Uh, I love the bandsaw but the bandsaw stop was poorly conceived and I'll show you why when we get there. I'm going to have to make another one at some point in the future. Here's a little quibble with the uh, bandsaw. Uh, all in all, like I said before, the Baxter Verticut has been a very good saw, but some things are lacking. So if you look at this, this is a very rough casting. This is the clamp and it goes like this. So this portion right here is what pulls against the stock. And since it's at a significant angle, it doesn't pull very evenly. So I'm going to machine this to a flat surface here. Uh, these other ones don't really matter. Nothing actually really matters other than that relative to the shaft that goes down the middle. So. Uh, we're going to pop over the milling machine and fix that real quick. All right, so I've got this guy in here and I've lined it up using this bar, which goes through the, uh, what would you call it, the angle uh, plate on the uh, bandsaw. And then the screw pushes against the opposite side. So this is the alignment thing. But as you can see, it's not a precision fit at all. So I got it very close, uh, depending on where the shaft is, sort of got it centered. Anyways, uh, now we're going to come up and do uh, make this side square and hopefully we'll have a better bearing surface because right now as you can see there's like a, an almost an eighth of an inch maybe just a little under maybe a hundred thousandths uh, uh, ridge there so we're going to fix that well that's uh, nicely cleaned up so I now I've got a good flat bearing surface which will be better than that little ridge that I had before and if you're curious about how far it went remember I said about a hundred thousandths look at that that's a hundred thousandths after first touch off not a bad guess I mean, uh, I probably could have gotten away with 90 something and not had a mark, uh, but uh, I decided to go for an even amount. That's pretty good. Hopefully, I didn't thin this up too much. If this really gets uh, to be a problem, I could always add a steel plate on the inside and screw it on here. So that's another option. Hopefully, we won't crack the casting. It looks pretty thick. The webs are still pretty meaty. So we're at the bandsaw, ready to cut uh, 12 pieces. Actually, I'm going to do 13 to have a spare of uh, the part just to rough cut them and then I'll fi finish the final sizing in the lathe. Uh, this is the Baco Easy Cut Blade and it looks like it's something like uh, 
10 to 12 teeth per inch. I didn't actually count. Um, but again, they claim that it doesn't matter whether you're doing really big stock or really thin stock, this blade's designed to work with either. So I'm giving it a shot and I'm kind of excited about it. Now, the saw itself came with this stop system, but uh, you can't adjust the height of the stop part. So it's too high for the parts I'm gonna cut off here. Um, you, can, you could rotate it and, uh, let's see if I can get this here. You can slide it down like that so it's at the bottom, but then it's nowhere near the fence, so that's kind of useless. Um, but it really needs another piece to attach here so that you can uh, actually do small pieces. And then this would work all right. It's got, it's, it's, it's all clearly roughly made, although they did a beautiful job on the knurling on these knobs here, all three of them. But uh, anyways, it only works for bigger stock, not smaller stock. So maybe I'll make an adapter piece to fit on here and then that'll solve my problem. In the meantime, we're going to go with the old, good old fashioned piece of steel and uh, C-clamp and we're going to cut some brass stock. So we're going to cut this guy off the first piece, measure it, make sure it's what I want. And then we're going to cut a couple more. Although you'll notice that there's not much clamping length left on this, although it's a nice flat surface now, which is a definite improvement. But uh, I will have to put a piece of metal to stick out to extend the clamp force out farther uh, so I can clamp one more piece or do it by hand. This isn't very dangerous material, though round material wants to spin out of your hand when the blade grabs it, so maybe not ideal. All right, so what I've done is I've touched the face just to find the rough depth, gone over 25 thousandths, and we're just gonna face these off. And uh, what I'll be doing after that is I'll, I'll do all 12, or 13 rather, then I'm gonna flip the part over, and uh, we'll do the same thing on the other side. Oh, this is brass. So with brass, because it's such a mess, uh, and it just seems to stick everywhere, I tend to, uh, throw some magnets down and then a piece of uh, cloth just to capture most of the crap. So I've locked my carriage, so I'm gonna take each part, I'm gonna put it in all the way till I hit the depth stop, face it off, pull it out, and uh, move on to the next one. I won't even have to remeasure or anything. If I was really good, I would have to, I could do it while the lathe is still moving and save myself some time. So there's uh, the first side faced off. Pop the next one in. Snug it gently. Get close. And when I flip this guy around and I do the other side, once I get the part dialed in, I'm gonna lock my carriage off at that point again. And uh, I won't have to look after that. They'll all be the right length. And the specs for this are really loose anyways. All right, let me bring you back when I flip it around. By the way, this collet chuck I have is great, but what would be even better is what a lot of the YouTube machinists out there have, which is a collet closer. And uh, I unfortunately do not have one of those. Would love to have one, but uh, they're really expensive to buy new. And since they're custom for every uh, internal tube on every lathe, uh, probably can't just easily find one on eBay the way I find most of my tools. Another thing I forgot to mention that I did mention in my last video is that 5C collets, uh, you know, this depth varies with how tight you make it. And if you're really trying to do precise parts, then you need the depth to be the same each time, which means you need to be the same tightness. So I'm going to mark off a line here on my uh, chucks so that when I tighten it, every time I can come right back to the same point. Again, this isn't a precision operation, but it's a good habit to get into for those times when you do. So 
So I've iterated a couple times and we now have everything locked off at this measurement and uh, depending on where I get it, uh, it sometimes shows up as uh, uh, 1.749, sometimes 1.750 on the money. Uh, these are just calipers. And again, the requirements aren't that stiff for this, so I think this will be good. All right, so I'm going to do the remaining uh, 12, and I'll be right back. Next up, originally what I did was after this, after I'd faced both sides, got things to dimensions, I drilled both sides and did the grooving last, actually at the very end. Uh, but I think that's a mistake because when I do the drilling, I need the depth stop out. So rather than having to take it out, put it back in, I'll save myself time by doing the grooving now. And that way, the depth stop will help me set my position for the grooving tool. So I took some 21 thousandths uh, feeler gauge, uh, moved the tool up until it just started to catch, moved the full tool over 21 thousandths, then moved the tool over its width, or 0.0625. Call it zero. Now the edge of the tool is at the end of this, and I want to go over another 0.0625 which is the groove location. And we will lock our, our apron again. And now I need my zero so I can uh, just turn this guy on. And we're good. And again, we can pop our parts out without moving anything. I will have to uh, concentrate on getting the uh, depth right every time, but uh, that's no big deal. I don't exactly have a depth stop. And move on to the next. Bring you right back change of plans and I thought you might find this interesting so I'll explain my thoughts here. So if I did the large, uh, using the depth stop so I could use the large drill, do the large drill bit first which has a 0.75 inch depth of drilling and then do the full through drill uh, with the, uh, once I take the depth stop out, uh, that all seemed like a great idea because the depth stopped in here which means I take the parts in and out and they'd always be the same depth. I can use my DRO on my tailstock to go 0.75 inches each time Here's the problem though. Normally, when you want to quickly remove a drill bit from work, you release the brake on the tailstock and slide the whole tailstock back. Can't do that or I'll lose my reference point. However, if I wind this guy out enough so that I can get the part out after I've drilled it, I'm going to have to wind back two inches each time and then wind back in two inches for the next part. It's just going to be easier to refine my zero. So I'm going to start with, uh, this is the rear of the part, but I am still going to start and drill all the way through. And then I will follow up with the larger drill bit uh, using this to set my zero each time. Uh, I thought about it and I don't think I'd save any time the other way. So I've already removed my depth stock. So each time I will be figuring it out anew as far as uh, where my zero is. So the small hole is going to be drilled for the, uh, the pilot hole size of the Dumont brooch. And Dumont brooch is very nicely uh, laser print on the size of the uh, pilot hole, which is 1964 in this case for a 932nd brooch. So we're going to do that first and we will follow up by getting my zero and drilling the big hole three quarters of an inch deep. Through hole first. And this being brass, I don't know that I'm going to need to start with a center drill, so I'm going to skip that step if it seems like it's okay, which so far it does. Okay, that'll work. That was uh, all the way through the part. Next up, big drill bit. And we'll just repeat this process for each part. So I've got my DRO on and I will just touch, just touch, find my zero, move in 21 thousandths to compensate, 
re-zero. And we're going to go in three quarters of an inch. Might want to slow this down a little. I was wondering about that brass. I thought the surface feet per minute was much, much higher, but we're going to go much slower. That's a lot better. It's practically falling in on its own. One problem with the DRO I used is it's a little bit slow to read, and if you move too quickly, it won't catch up and you will over drill your depth. So I'm going slow here because the weight of the wheel is enough to, uh, to drill on its own. Okay, first part done. 11 more to go, I'll bring it back. Alrighty, so we're all set for broaching. The only difference this time between the way did the last time is that uh, I'm going to use the air jack uh, this time because it'll speed up the process. But i got to be really careful and go slowly because it's a pretty fragile brooch. It's smaller than the last one. Uh, also, I discovered that this thing was not sitting straight up and down because these two press plates are not the same thickness by a fair amount. Like, I've got a 21,000 shim that I used elsewhere on this, and that lined up pretty well. So, anyways, let's get on with broaching. Let me pull you into the action here. And there's the result. Next stop, we're going to head over and we're going to head over to the mill after I do the other uh, 12 of these guys, which uh, here, got the container right here. So we got to do uh, the remaining 11. Then we're going to head over to the mill and slot this guy and this project will be done. Interesting phenomenon I didn't discover with the other brooch is that uh, after I'm done broaching, each one of these gets stuck in here. And I have to take that key I, I designed to hold it, uh, you know, to find my... Uh, perpendicular position. I have to take that key, put it in a vise, and then take the block and rotate the block to free it up. I'm adding lube to the inside of the block area every time, but uh, for whatever reason on these, it's not helping. So I'm having to, uh, I'm having to fight to get them out, which is really weird because uh, the last one went through and was no problem getting it out. Anyways, we'll continue on. As before, I use my coaxial indicator to set my zero my X and Y zero for the dead center of this part. That way I know where the center line is that I'm going to uh, cut my uh, slot along. Next, I've got to align the adapter bar that I made, the new one, and uh, this one will uh, slide in there and then I'll take an indicator across it. And then I'm gonna look for a way to align this much more quickly. So uh, stay tuned. Alrighty, so here's all the details. I have the depth stop in the 5C Kalachuk, so these parts will go in the same depth every time. I'm going to load this piece in with each new part and line it up with the plate right behind here, which you can't see. Let me pull wide. Line it up with the plate here with the straight edge. Then, once that's lined up, I'll lock the part off. The depth will be fixed each time, and I'm going to go to 0.438. I set my initial depth by touching off with the cutter. Uh, with this uh, feeler gauge right above the part. And once I felt it touch, it's 21 thousandths over the part, compensate for 21 thousandths, went down 0.438, set my new zero at 0.438, and that's how deep I need to go. So each cut, I think I'll do something on the order of 50 thousandths, and uh, that should be pretty good. Last pass, and then we deburr. 
lot of stick out for a really thin little drill bit. So we gotta take it gently and slow. And we're done. Another interesting approach, since this is a very long cutter and transverse cuts are gonna try and make it break, uh, I can plunge cut. And I can do that with relative ease. And I'll finish off, I'll have a finishing pass where I'll clean it up. Well, the plunge cut method was a failure because enough bit deflection apparently to cause them to get rounded out and not, I couldn't square them off after, which is really unfortunate. I've had good success with this technique in the past, but uh, not uh, today. I just blew two parts. And here's the solution I'm using finally. Ultra high RPMs, which is uh, 3000. Solid carbide cutter. Doing the whole thing at one time, just very slowly. Watching to make sure the chips clear and don't clog the flutes. Historically, I've had really poor luck with these solid carbide cutters, but uh, I'm doing okay today, knock on wood. And that was my fastest solution yet. Part done. I want this one noted for the record book. Solid carbide cutter, eighth inch diameter, or 3.2 something millimeters. And I did a 0.438 depth of cut, single pass. And didn't break one. Unbelievable, never used one of these without breaking one before. And this time I took a huge depth of cut, but just did it manually by hand, very, gently and uh, worked out great. Also left really nice even sidewalls, much better than the high speed steel cutter. I guess because the enhanced rigidity. All right, so we're finally done. And uh, this was a really interesting project. The prototype was not a big deal and uh, it was kind of straightforward. And I was trying to think of how I was gonna manufacture it while I did the process. But the reason I showed you this video is because this actually was the manufacturing process and I had to get it down so that it didn't take as long. So I improved a lot of things, uh, a lot of operations to speed things up, which I tried to explain my reasoning behind. And I think I got this down to fairly uh, efficient process. So a uh, couple interesting things to note, uh, if taking a full bite with a carbide cutter, which you wouldn't think an eighth inch cutter would be able to handle without breaking, but uh, makes a very clean cut. The high speed steel cutter had a lot of deflection and uh, did really nasty job, uh, even doing 50 thousandths passes. And uh, trying to peck at it, which normally works quite well, but I've only done it with carbide, uh, doesn't work very well at all. And you get massive deflection out of that uh, high speed steel cutter. So those, I, I wasted two parts and basically uh, ruined them. Uh, this project was great because it uh, taught me how to make a bunch of tools. And uh, so this tool was not only for aligning these these parts uh, to do the slot, but it also turned out to be very nece necessary to get the parts out of this guy because after you were done pressing it, um, the bottom expanded very slightly and it stuck in. So I put this upside down in the vise, turned this guy and popped the uh, part out and that worked like a champ. And uh, I'll remember that for next time in future projects. Uh, this project uh, really tested my ability to get efficiency down and uh, I learned a ton so I hope you find it interesting and I hope it's uh, worth doing on top of the other video and I want to put a shout out to Baco uh, which is uh, a subsidiary of Snap-on uh, because they did this this blade so far has performed really well uh, to break in the blade I cut some one inch plate and I cut all these slices off here um, at really low pressure so that you could uh, break in the blade properly. And uh, as you can see, it did a pretty darn good job. And then uh, when I got to this project, it was already broken in and away we went. Uh, you probably can't break it in on brass anyways. Uh, learned to use the depth stop, depth stop really efficiently and that turns out to be a really handy tool. And that was well worth buying. It's not even very expensive. So anyways, hope you find it interesting. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.